my topic is faith as a bridge. Being at the point of dealing with end of life issues is very devastating. I've dealt with them caring for my parents and my brothers and now with my 87 year old sister who's in a retirement home. Dealing with these issues has notched away at our family circle to the extent that my son Tony and I, we only have each other and some very close friends, as I'd call them, my extended family. For me, my faith was the steel backbone <coughs> that gave me the strength. That in a great part is something that I've grown up with, prayer, mass, not always 630, and the strength that faith gives was a part of my life for my parents. They were the real survivors. As I rewind my life to an early morning of March 25th, 1943, in a little town in Poland called Pentyki, my brother John looked out the door of our home to see the town all aflame attacked by Ukrainian nationalists siding with the Nazis at that time. He woke up the entire family, my mom being eight months pregnant with me. With whatever they had on, they took off and ran through the woods. They ran headed for, I'm sorry, they ran headed for the forest. I can't even imagine the fear that they had felt. My mom was so tired she held my brother Tony's hand, who was nine years old, and my brother Louis, who was 13. She was so tired and exhausted, she wanted to hide in a potato cellar, and that was kind of what people had in those days to store um, like vegetables through the winter and stuff. She wanted to hide in that cellar, but Louis pulled her, Louis was really sharp. He pulled her hand, <coughs> hollering at her to, Mom, we gotta move, we have to move. The flames are coming closer. After, so they started walking, but after a short distance, my mom turned around and the entire cellar and house was in flames. Angels carried them through the, those woods that cold early spring morning. I remember my parents saying that people and animals were running in all directions trying to dodge gunshots and flames. I remember my dad, I forgot to mention this, but I remember my dad saying that they had a wagon and, oh, excuse me, and a horse. And what he did, he took a big quilt, what we call the pijina, and he put it on the wagon so that my mother could get comfortable to sit on, you know, and that's how they were going to take off. But as it turned out, the horse got spooked by all the flames and took off with the wagon in tow. I remember, oh, I'm sorry. Mom and the boys ended up just running in all, well, people and animals running in all directions, trying to dodge gunshots and flames. Mom and the boys ended up in the next little town seeking refuge in a church there. Shortly, other neighbors started to congregate there. Can you imagine? No food, only the clothes on their back, and nothing else. The next day, my dad and some of the other men decided to go and see the destruction of that little town that we lived in. They found my grandmother, well, they found the village leveled by flames. Within a couple hours, 11 members of my family were slaughtered. My grandmother and two aunts, who had their arms wrapped around each other, were found clubbed to death with a metal pole by their side. One was a deaf mute. She couldn't even scream out. An aunt and four children, four of her children, were suffocated in the house her husband, my uncle, was shot. My grandfather, who had asthma, stopped to rest of all places in the knot house. With a bullet having gone through the wood boards directly through his heart. 
My uncle Stanley with Link was sent to Siberia. The devastation was unbelievable. The house was ransacked, with the furniture and all my parents' possession gone. My father was able to find some pictures and papers that were strewn outside. And it was really weird because there was a picture of St. Anthony that my grandfather, the one that was shot, um, had he made the frame. And, well, a few years before my mother had passed away, she had given me that picture. Imagine it, it had traveled all that entire journey. It's that picture's hanging in my bedroom. The men at that time did not bury the dead. It was too dangerous because you never knew. They didn't know who was around. There were bodies all over in that town. It was just too emotionally devastating. After a couple days, the villagers were told it was too dangerous to stay in the church. The pastor told them to move on, and who knows whatever happened to that pastor. So the hike started with the goal of reaching the next town, town some miles away, Woods. My mom and had Tony and Louie in tow, hungry, exhausted, Tony crying that he was hungry. His lips were bleeding. My mother, even though she herself was starving and exhausted, comforted the boys, assuring them, reassuring them to hold on, that Woods would soon be there and there would be food, promising the boys that God had protected them to this point and he would provide for them also. My sister relates the fact that at some point during this walk to Woods, a woman was coming toward mom and the two boys, upon seeing them, offered one of the loaves of bread that she had in her bag. The town that she, this woman was in was not attacked, because they would do this at random. My mom saw that woman as an angel, who in most probability was sharing her supper with mom and the boys. Over the years, I remember my mom recalling that angel often and had her always in prayer. And my brother Tony knew our Lord had not forgotten a small child's hunger. My parents met up in Woods, because everybody was going in a different direction when the massacre happened. There in a monastery compound attached to a cathedral I had been born, an aunt that had gotten there had given my mother a scarf and she wrapped me up in that. Ever after several weeks, we were taken to Germany by a cattle uh, car train to a hard labor camp on the island of Silt. There, my mother dug graves for Nazi soldiers. Dad worked in the coal mines with my 15-year-old brother, Johnny. My two older siblings were in other camps. I was left in the care of the 9 and the 13-year-old, who, as I often was told, protected me from Bombe, which is bombs, by placing me in the facsimile of a house foxhole, or like a trench that they had dug, covering me with branches for protection in their young mind they thought they were. I can't even imagine. Mom would find me at night dirty and filthy wet, screaming from hunger, but safe. I'm telling you, I must have had an angel with me. My parents were trucked out to labor at six in the morning, and brought back at night at six, with only black bread in the morning with coffee that they made from chicory, which I think is still available here, but I, I tried it once and it's horrible. And that was for all day, for labor. My mother, I remember telling me what she would do is drink the hot coffee in the morning and then take eat a little bit of the bread and take the rest of the bread and have it at some point during the day. 
And then when they came back, when they were trucked back from the labor, they had a bottle, uh, I mean, a bowl of watery potato soup, or the big thing with the Nazis was rutabaga. And I'm sure everybody here loves it, but that was, um, that was what they got. And sometimes the soup had bugs in it. I remember mom telling me that. And only with the grace of God did we survive. My brother Louis was very sharp, and somehow he connected to a German woman who worked in the Nazi kitchen. She would slip food for him, knowing that there was a baby in the barrack. Apparently, the food was such that I was able to eat it. That, and with my mother nursing, and she didn't have enough to eat herself, I survived to be standing here on the stool. <laughs> my father was a shoemaker by trade, and when he was a young man, he uh, had uh, worked in Germany as an apprentice for a while, so that he learned the German language very well. And the fact that he was a shoemaker, they used him to fix the boots for the Nazi soldiers, and that got him a little favor. After the war ended in 1945, we were shipped from one camp to another. My brothers were going to school at that point. My brother Louis got into some sort of student exchange program coming to America. He befriended a farmer who in turn sponsored mom, dad, my brother Tony and I to come to America and thus began our lives in the States. Now, as I look back, I always saw the strength and the deep, profound faith in my parents. They lost so much in their lives, had so much pain and injustice done to them. They never gave up, never lost that faith, and lived to the age of 90, Mom, and my dad to 96, and always, always with a prayer on their lips. How can I not emulate them? They are in a large part responsible for that faith in me that doesn't falter. That is my fountain of strength and spirit. I always had a deep devotion to the little flower. Even as a child, I always visualized her as someone small like me, but of course, very strong of spirit and faith. She went to Jesus in prayer as a child, simple and direct to what I think sustains me. I'm around little ones all the time, as a lunch mom, as a CCD teacher. When I walk out of that classroom each day, I feel like I'm six feet tall. <laughs> and I volunteer at the nursing home. And there too, those residents beam when they see me or Tony. They too are so simple and direct. I would imagine the little flower did little things in a big way. And that's how I live my life now. Thank you. I live a good day.